What if space aliens are really just ETs using AI? I'm Tanya Hall for ZDNet and Tech Republic, and joining me is Dr. Seth Shostak, Senior Astronomer at the SETI Institute. Welcome, Dr. Shostak. Thank you very much, Tanya. Most people recognize SETI as the place where scientists search for extraterrestrial life. What is your personal mission at SETI? Well, my personal mission is to, uh, to, to succeed, really. We're looking for life in space, and you know, most of the people working here are looking for life nearby in the solar system. So maybe life on Mars or some of the moons of Jupiter or Saturn. Uh, that life would be microscopic, of course. You're probably not going to find little gray guys or anything like that on any of these nearby worlds. But at least you can get to them with rockets, so that's, that's appealing. The, the project that I'm involved with is, in fact, what's called SETI. And we're looking for life that's not just alive, but also intelligent. And uh, we do that by doing what Jodie Foster did in the movie Contact. We try and eavesdrop on their radio signals. So we at ZDNet and Tech Republic talk a lot about the different use cases for AI or artificial intelligence. And I've had guests from SETI tell us how you use AI in, in your research there. But you recently wrote an article on how a NASA scientist suggests aliens actually might use AI. Tell us the story behind that suggestion. Well, my suggestion is actually not only that they use AI, and I have no doubt that anybody that's at least as advanced as we are from a technological point of view also uses artificial intelligence. It's sort of a, it seems like an inevitable development of, you know, ultimately, but that they might be AI. I mean, you know, I, ever since I was a kid, I would go to these movies uh, that featured aliens. Maybe that's when I developed my interest in them. And of course, most of the aliens there were, I mean, they're, their goals in life were simply to come to Earth and trash it, okay, uh, which doesn't differ actually from many of the goals of, the, of my neighbors, it seems. But the, the, the real point is that once you get to the, you know, to, to the level of developing radio technology so that our experiments could, in principle, pick you up, in other words, you're advanced enough that we could find you, then you're, you know, only 50 or 100 years away from developing computers, and maybe another 50 or 100 years away from developing artificial intelligence, not the kind that plays a good game of chess, but that can, you know, write a novel or something like that. So we are doing that. And if we are doing it, then many of them have already done it. I think the majority of the intelligence in the cosmos is probably, you know, artificial, synthetic. The aliens are not soft, squishy, gray guys. They're machines. You know, many scientists say it's taken about three billion years to go from microbial mats to self-aware human life on Earth. So, but the universe is thought to be about 14 billion years old. So should that be enough time for other life to arise, become advanced enough to build AI-based probes and have those probes cross galaxies to get here? Well, uh, everything except the last seems to me to be fairly self-evident that, yeah, it's possible. I mean, you know, there, there are a whole bunch of stars. Well, not a whole bunch, but there are some stars, most of the ones you see at night with your eyes, actually, that are very short-lived. You know, nobody's going to develop artificial intelligence on a planet around a, one of these bright stars because the, the, the star goes nuts long before, you know, anything has gone beyond microbial stage, even if it gets to microbes. So there are some, some places you can rule out. You're, you're never going to get into artificial intelligence there. Everybody's going to do, be destroyed long before you get to that point. But the overwhelming majority of stars live at least, you know, 10 billion years like our own sun. So that should be plenty of time to develop artificial intelligence. Even if, you know, your funding isn't really optimal, 10 billion years, you might be able to do something. So I, I think it's probably happened a lot, yes. Is there a use case for Earth-bound AI and analyzing all UFO sightings to see if alien AI has visited Earth? Well, I, I think that there is a use case for that. I don't investigate UFO sightings myself. The SETI Institute doesn't do that because it, you know, it doesn't really lend itself to too much scientific investigation because it's one of those deals where I saw something, but you know, if I go back there now and look, I, I don't see it anymore. And if you can't routinely you know, get some data, then it's very hard to do science with that. I get phone calls every day from people who have seen things in the sky. Sometimes they send me uh, photos and videos, but the, the photos and videos are usually quite uninformative. <laughs> it's sort of a bright dot, you know, wiggling around the screen as they hold their cell phone to the sky. Artificial intelligence, however, might be useful in the case of UFOs uh, 
to go through the enormous corpus of data that exists out there and say, okay, is there anything here that really looks like it might be for real? I am personally very doubtful that we're being visited. I think that would be wonderful if we were being visited, either wonderful or apocalyptic, but uh, I, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't see any good evidence for that. But it is useful for, for us to try and sift through all the, the millions and millions of frequencies, radio frequencies that we monitor to see if we found a signal that looks good. AI might be very useful for that. On what do you base your bet of a cup of coffee that will find ET by 2035? Yes, I, you know, that was said rather casually at a, at a conference in Germany a number of years ago. And uh, I am uh, thinking about whether I should regret having said that because I may have to buy a lot of coffee. Uh, but the reason I said it, other than to provoke the audience, which needed some provoking, by the way, some provocation to wake them up, it was simply that if you look at the speed of the searches that we're doing, that's totally dependent on the computers and technology. And, you know, I'm here in the Silicon Valley, and it's a well-known economic law, the Silicon Valley, that every two years, more or less, the speed of computers that you can buy for, at a, you know, at any given price point doubles. Okay, so that, that actually affects our search for ET because that's, you know, that doubles the speed at which we can sort of go through star systems and check them out. So on that basis, I could say, okay, by 2035, 24, somewhere around there, we will have looked at a million or a couple of million star systems. That's a number that I think is maybe big enough to suggest that we'll be successful. So I offered to buy everybody a cup of coffee if we haven't found ET by then. I may be buying a lot of coffee. <laughs> Should the day come when scientists discover solid evidence of other life in the universe, how should it be announced to the general public? I mean, how do you expect the reactions of governments, organized religion, and the public at large? Well, nobody really knows, actually. Uh, a lot of people have thought about that. You know, what would be the reaction? Uh, most people in the streets that I talk to say, oh, well, you know, uh, the public would go nuts. And as a consequence, the government is going to shut down your search. I mean, they're just going to keep it quiet. They're going to keep it under wraps. Now, we know that isn't true. And, you, you know, people believe me or they don't believe me. But we've had false alarms where you could actually see what happens. I mean, when I say a false alarm, when we pick up a signal that looks to us like what we're looking for, th th this looks like an ET signal. And, you know, I keep waiting for Will Smith and the other men in black to show up or whatever, or the government to show up or the government to make a phone call, something, 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 something. And in fact, nothing happens. Nobody seems to be interested. We don't keep it quiet. Uh, you know, everybody immediately starts writing on their blog, hey, wow, we got this interesting signal. Of course, it would take about a week to check it out. So we're not uh, absolutely sure. But we have run that. We've had a dry run on, on what happens. And you can say, look, this is what, the way we're going to do it. We're going to have a press conference. We're going to have none of that. None of that is germane. I mean, it's interesting, but it's just it doesn't address the truth of the matter. The truth of the matter is if we were to pick up a signal or any other SETI operation or any other investigation of the sky for that matter what happens is the first thing that goes on is that the the media start calling you up there's absolutely no secrecy here and as a result that means that you know you're you're, you're you you'll open your browser and find out about it and that's how it will be announced dr seth shostak senior astronomer at the seti institute if somebody wants to maybe follow you maybe ask questions about uh, connecting with aliens or maybe they want to listen to your podcast how do they go about doing that it's all pretty easy. I mean, just go to SETI.org organization and uh, you'll find all this kind of stuff. And uh, I am also very easy to find. My name is Seth, which is almost SETI. It's only one letter off. It sounds like Hal from 2001, doesn't it? Uh, and I'm, I'm the only Seth here at the SETI Institute. Sounds good. And if you guys want to find more of my interviews, you can do that right here on ZDNet or Tech Republic or go to my website, tanyahall.net. I've got links to all my social sites. Thanks for watching.